chest. One, two. Good evening. Good evening. We want to welcome everyone to our midweek services here at the Benton Church of Christ. We're glad that everyone could come out tonight. We want to welcome any visitors that we may have tonight. Um, by way of announcements, um, some announcements that aren't in the bulletin or are not out in the foyer or on the email. Our sympathy is expressed to Ken and Bonnie Dudlap in the passing of their daughter, Teresa Craig. Her memorial will be September the 7th at 2 p.m. at Northside Church of Christ in Jeffersonville, Indiana. Uh, by way of the 6th, Steve Bennett stepped on a rusty nail and is having some complications from that, so let's keep him in our prayers. Shelly Mae Collins was recently in Marshall County Hospital. Um, not sure if, uh, if she's out now, but anybody have any update on her? Okay. 
So let's keep her in our prayers. John Henson is still at home after suffering a broken leg. He can now have visitors if you want to uh, visit him and visit them and see how, see how he's doing. Uh, Flo Jones will have medical procedure performed at, at a hospital in Louisville next Tuesday, September 9th. And so please remember her in prayer and send her a card of encouragement if you can. Her address is posted in the daily update and will be in the bulletin this week. Uh, tonight we turn to our regular Wednesday night class schedule. Our summer series is over and we had a great series of speakers this summer. But tonight we go back to our regular classes. And I'm assuming that we, all the kids will move up a grade uh, starting tonight. So they'll go to their new classes depending on whatever the grade or age they're at right now. Uh, there will be an office and administration meeting tonight following services. If you would like to go to the Glendale Road Ladies' Day this Saturday, the bus will leave from the church building at 8.30. All senior adults are invited to attend the fourth annual area-wide Senior Fellowship Day at the Lone Oak Church of Christ on Thursday, September 25th from 8.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. The church bus will leave the building at 8 a.m., and you must sign up by September 12th in the foyer. If you have any questions, you can ask Bob or Jane Hines regarding that. Uh, you are invited to attend the wedding and reception of Caleb Lee and Rebecca Rickard, the granddaughter of Judy Hines, on Saturday evening, September the 6th at 5 p.m. here uh, at Benton Church Christ. Um, I guess back in the reception room. Or actually, the wedding will be here in the reception, back in the reception room, I'm assuming. So that's this Saturday uh, at 5 p.m. And next Friday, September the 12th, is our annual fish fry. So we want to invite our friends, co-workers, neighbors, anyone uh, that we can think of to that fish fry so we can make that a success. And then that Sunday is, will be homecoming Sunday, September the 14th. And we have a goal of 450 on that Sunday morning. So we each, everybody needs to invite several people so we can reach our goal and make that a great day uh, for our homecoming Sunday, the 14th, um, same weekend as our fish fry. Are there any other announcements that need to be made at this time? No? Okay. Uh, Ethan Walker will lead our singing tonight. Travis will have our devotional, and Jared Morgan will lead our opening prayer. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for the blessings of the day. We thank you for the blessings of this week. We uh, have many plans here at the church as we go forward through the next uh, couple of weeks, Lord, and we pray that uh, those plans will be part of your will and that you will bless those plans. Father, we thank you for the, uh, the growth and the numerical growth and the spiritual growth we've had here as a church, and we pray that uh, uh, we can see numerical growth, but we also pray that we can grow closer to you and, and become stronger uh, Christians and grow more in your word. Father, we ask that uh, you be with the many that are sick, uh, those who passed away and had, uh, had loved ones pass, and those who are in need of prayers for physical health. And we ask that you will uh, bless them as you see fit, and to comfort those, and to bless those who, who need uh, physical, spirit, physical blessings uh, to get better. Father, we ask that you uh, bless our country with peace, and our world with peace, and that you will Allow us to live uh, peaceful lives and those around us to live peaceful lives. We ask that uh, all these things in your son's name, in his name, amen. amen. You're my all in all. <clears throat> we'll sing, number, oh, sorry, uh, number 484. And for those of you who might not be familiar with this song, all, everybody sings the first stanza and then... Second time around, the women sing part two, and the men sing the second stanza. And third time, men sing part two, and women sing stanza one. So, and then everybody's all together again at the fourth. So. <clears throat> you must
860. <clears throat> there is a habitation. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. <clears throat> there is a You will be opening your Bibles to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Over the past few months and weeks, you have heard uh, many of us come up here and, and talk about different ministries of the church. In my humble opinion, I think God is blessing this congregation um, with the ministries that we have. And, and as you can tell, our numbers um, here in, in the uh, our worship services it's growing I think there is a, um, um, a time in the history here where people are, are wanting to be a part of this church and they're wanting this church to grow uh, it was just a, like I said a few short weeks ago where Corey and and Jason Jones and and uh, Aaron Lyles got up here and began to tell you about our kids first and after school program and that Sunday morning uh, we, we gave you some of our needs I'm here this, uh, this, this evening to tell you that, there, that we need um, some help in the after-school program. Uh, to kind of just catch you up with where we are in the after-school program, let me take you back to um, imagine you being in third grade, third or uh, fourth grade in the after-school program. Many of our kids, they begin with us through kindergarten. But imagine hitting that third grade and you start looking at your third and fourth grade. Your kids are ahead of you you start to get more privileges in the after school program. And if you graduate um, the fifth grade in the after school program, you're welcome to come back and be a helper. So you have to kind of go through our program and then you're allowed to stay uh, in the after school program as a helper. And it's a great uh, benefit uh, for the parents because their children still have a place to come, a safe place to come to after school hours from three to five. Because that is such a blessing for many families in our community, um, we have about 14 to 15 middle school students who are actively involved in our after school program. Because the after school program is geared essentially for the kindergarten through the fifth grade that leaves the, the middle school kids not unattended, not uncared for, but it's a, an opportunity. See, God blesses us with kids here. Now, 
to me, it's, um, it's an opportunity for us as a congregation to continue building upon the after school program. I'm going to read a passage from 2 Timothy, and I'm going to make how this is applicable to the after school program. So if you will, um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. Now this is Paul, Paul talking to Timothy here. It says, um, in the beginning of verse 14, it says, But as for you, continue what you have learned and, and have a family believed, knowing that from uh, whom you have learned it. And know and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through the faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is, God, uh, is, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So if I understand this correctly, what Paul is saying to Timothy is, Timothy... Continue in that good work, and you know this work because you've been taught it since you were a child. It's in your family. You know this work, and you know that, this, that the word that has been taught and brought to you, that has been instructed to you, it's God's word. It's important. Let's keep reading in verse 1 of chapter 4. I charge you in the presence of God and, and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, by his appearing in his kingdom, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have an itching their ears will accumulate for themselves teaching to suit their own passions. And will turn away from the listening to the truth and wander off into myths. What a tragedy it would be for us or for God to bless this congregation with 14 souls who may or may not know God's word. What a tragedy would, uh, would, it, would it be for God to lay such an awesome opportunity for us as a congregation to teach these children God's word. From 3.30 to 4.30, as of right now, these middle schoolers really, they have a schedule, but they're, it's, it's not anything serious. So here's what I would like. I would like two couples. If they're retired, that's great. But I would like them to alternate weeks for one hour a day. Uh, this couple would take one week and, and the next couple take the following week. One hour a day to come up here, help them with their homework for 15, 20 minutes, and then teach the Word of God for 30 minutes. And we have a room set up. It's ready to go. All we need is somebody to come and to take this ministry. This is an awesome opportunity. And God is blessing us. We don't want these children to not know God's Word. We don't want them not to be able to have never heard the gospel. Now, they come through the, the after-school program. They hear some of it. But the middle school years is a very important years. For, an, for a young adolescent. If you're interested in this ministry, please come see me and I will give you more of an explanation. I have all the, I have all the material that you would need. I just need someone who would take time to teach it. This is, an, like I said, an, an opportunity and it's vital. The elders asked me to, to take this time to uh, issue that challenge to you guys. Um, I come from a, a, a football background, if you will, and um, I come from Mayfield. And if you know anything about Mayfield football, we don't back down from a challenge. You know, win or lose, we're going we're gonna to die trying. And so I hope that's the mentality that we have here in this congregation, that if there's a challenge or a, an opportunity or an issue that rises before us, we're not going to back down. We're going to try it, try to attack it any way we can. Now, setting that aside, I also want to take this opportunity to extend the Lord's invitation. The Lord's invitation is to anybody who wants a relationship with God through Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus came to this earth as God in flesh. He came to this earth as a, on a mission to die as a sacrificial lamb for your sins, that your sins might be forgiven, that you can be reunited with God and have that God's presence with you so that when you pass from this earth, that the blood of Christ 
in the life that you lived in Christ may forgive you so that in the day of judgment, God, or Jesus will stand before you and say, I know him, and then you'll be entered into heaven by God's welcome. So tonight I want to encourage you that if you're not a Christian, to, to become a Christian tonight. Or if you are a Christian and you're struggling and you just need the prayers of the church, we also want to encourage you tonight while we, while we stand and sing.
All right, if I can get all this technology laid out up here. Hey, I need a, I need a desk this wide. Kenny, don't hit that. <laughs> we, we, yeah, yeah, right. This guy, this guy could spill a Coke three tables over. Have a pass around. Fish fry. There are some names already on it uh, that are working in certain areas. If you can and will help, put your name where you could or would help. How about that? All right. Anything we need to cover before we start? All right, it's almost... 30 minutes after, and uh, I'd like to get into this a little bit if we could tonight, so I'm going to get started quickly, and uh, just grab hope, here we go, that's all I know to tell you. Um, what I'm going to do for the next probably few months I'm going to talk about the church in the Old Testament. Now, is there any such thing? Why, why do we teach our children about the Old Testament? Good stories, right. Absolutely. Appreciate that, Billy. You can always depend on him. He's ready. And that is correct. They're interesting stories for those young people they can learn and remember all their lifetime. What do we prefer studying? New Testament? Old Testament? We prefer studying the New Testament in most cases, don't we? Is there a reason for that? That's where we're at. That's the one we're under, right? Right? Okay, we, we study about Jesus in the New Testament. We study about the plan of salvation. Uh, that's why so much pulpit time is spent on these issues. Uh, when someone becomes a Christian, the New Testament teaches them how to follow and walk that Christian life. Well and good. We believe that. We, we do that. We enjoy that. Now, are there reasons why we should study the Old Testament? They were examples for us. All right, uh, the verse that we usually run to is Romans 15, 4. For whatsoever things were written before were written for our learning. Now, what does it mean if it's written before, it's written for our learning? What can we learn? Okay, maybe we don't repeat the problems or make the same mistakes. All right. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says, Now these things that happened to them were examples. Okay, so can we use the Old Testament as examples of things that we're to do and not to do? All right, there we go. The apostles. It's our heritage. Uh, the apostles, if you'll think about in the New Testament, uh, you'll think about the number of times that the apostles and Jesus himself referred to the scriptures. When he's referring to the scriptures, what was he referring to? The Old Testament. Taught the Old Testament. Did a lot of teaching from the Old Testament. In fact, that's what Jesus did. Uh... How often, how much do we study the Old Testament? Quite a bit? Not enough? Some? Yeah, all kinds of those answers maybe. Uh, occasionally we'll have a class in here uh, on the Old Testament. Jay, when he was here, he loved the Old Testament. He taught Daniel a couple of times while he was here in four years, I think. And he taught Ezekiel. And Mark has taught... 
Mark taught one Old Testament. Job. Uh, years ago, I taught Isaiah. I've taught Habakkuk, Zephaniah. Uh, no, Habakkuk and Zach, Zachariah. So occasionally we have some of these Old Testament studies, right? Now, the thing I think we need to learn, or one thing that we need to really understand here is that, and don't jump on to me when I say this until I get a chance to qualify it a little bit. Almost everything we know about God comes from the Old Testament. We know how we got here because of the Old Testament, don't we? We know how God dealt with people because of the Old Testament. How much would we understand about God without the Old Testament? Probably not near as much as we understand today. Okay, now then, what we're going to do is going to be quite different. Now, I'm going to incorporate a lot of things. There are some of you in here, I've kind of looked around in this class to see. And uh, there are maybe just a few of you in here who have been in classes that I have taught some of this material. Some of it uh, in, in different times, in different classes. So I don't think from the looks of things, that we're going to be really, really repetitious, repetitious to anybody much. And, uh, you know, that's some of the things that we do in teaching, though, is we repeat. So I'm not going to apologize for the repetition, but I want the ones of you who have never seen this, I teach it about every 10 or 12 years. And... At my age, 10 or 12 years down the road, I might or might not be able to teach it again. Okay, so that's where I am. And that's really why I want to do this. And I am going to take you through the Bible and we are going to discuss the church. It will be a kind of an Old Testament survey, but I promise you it will not be anything like an Old Testament survey that you've ever been through. And that doesn't mean that we haven't been through some good ones and, and studied some good things, because we certainly have. But in this study, we're going to look at the church from the Old Testament. And I'm going to step out on a limb here again. And I'm going to make a statement to you that you're not going to understand right now. And that's okay. We'll work on it down the road. And that is, I believe, you can learn more about the church from the Old Testament than you can the New Testament. Anybody ever heard that statement made? I believe you can learn more. Now that's not, you know, there, there are qualifications to all of this statement. But there's so much to learn from the Old Testament concerning the church that folks, we haven't even scratched the surface. I promise you that. So what I'm going to do in the next little while is try to scratch that surface and dig in a little deeper maybe. Now, I've said all of that to prepare you for an Old Testament study. But the first thing I want to do is talk about the church in general just a little bit. Uh, for, for instance, uh, when did the church come into existence? Pentecost, okay. Who built the church? Jesus. What do we practice in the church? Teach salvation, the plan of salvation. We practice uh, worship according to the way the Christians worshipped in the New Testament times and all like that, okay? But there's so much that we can learn about the church. And uh, it all hinges 
on the study of probably one verse in the New Testament. First of all, before I go to that, and we're going to spend, and the reason I wanted to get started is because I'm going to be here two weeks, and I'll be off a week, and then I'll be back. But I'd like to get through this in two weeks, and then you can have one week to really wonder what I, you know, how crazy I really am, or <laughs> what I'm really doing. And then I'll be back, and y'all can fire away, and that'll be great. How do we identify the church in the New Testament? What are some of the names that we call the church? We, we don't just call it the church. We call it, uh, for one, we call it the body of Christ. All right, why do we call it the body of Christ? What does that term do? The body of Christ. All right. It, it tells you something about the structure of the church, doesn't it? The body. Who's the head? Christ. We are the body. We are functioning parts of that body as members. Is the church that Jesus built something that we can see and touch, or is it invisible? Pardon? Okay. Both. We are, we make up the church, don't we? The visible part of it. Have you ever seen the church that Jesus built? Where is it located? Right here. Okay. Point I'm making to you is that the church, is it physical or spiritual? It is spiritual. Can you see things that are spiritual? Pardon? Evidences of it. That's right. That's how we know they exist is because of evidences. Now, so we do not see something that is spiritual. So it has to be described in a way that we can understand it. One way of describing the spiritual church is calling it the body of Christ. That make sense? What are some other ways we describe the church? A kingdom. It is a kingdom because those who live in that body or that church are under the rule of, of Jesus Christ. We are subject to his throne, right? Another one. Family of God. We are the family of God. Assembly. The way, the bride of Christ. Okay. Okay. That's where I want to start, right there, Matt. I'm going to start in the, in the most unlikely place for you probably as far as study of the Old Testament. I want you to turn to Revelation 21, verse 9. <clears throat> Revelation 21, verse 9. And I've, I've been at this so long and I've done it enough that I, I've about cut out... Uh, dragging along and all of this. I'm just going gonna, gonna to tell you what I think as we go. This verse is probably one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible. It is a verse that we think we know all about and understand and we really have no idea what it means. Okay? Now, I've made several statements to you today that you may or not believe. But anyway, if I can get my iPad back here without dropping it. All right, we're going to look at Revelation 21.9. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. 
from your own conversation what you have just told me. What did the Lamb show John? What did the Lamb show John? I agree with that too. The church. What is the bride of Christ? The church. He says, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. Now, folks, I'm, I, I'm pleading with you just to stay with me and understand this. A misunderstanding of this verse causes us a tremendous misunderstanding. Not Misunderstanding is not the good word. It causes us not to have certain knowledge that we could gain about the church because we don't take this verse correctly. That means now, and I told you, I'm just gonna, we're going to shoot it right out and you can go home and think about this, read about it, whatever you want to do and come back next week and we'll be ready to go again. He said, I'm going to show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Folks, that is the church. Not heaven. The hardest thing it is to do today, almost the hardest thing it is for a person to do today who studies the Bible and comes to a conclusion about anything is to change his mind. Okay? I understand that. Most of you are sitting here thinking, that can't be. I've read no telling how many books I've read on Revelation. I've read one that took that view, and I read that a couple of years ago. I was told that there was another one, but I'm not sure. I've never seen it. I read an excerpt of Wayne Jackson's new book on Revelation about three or four months ago. And he said about this verse, and I loosely quote, okay? He said, at first glance, this appears to be talking about the church. But it cannot be. This fella, if you don't know who that is, he's the editor of Christian Chronicle. And probably has written as much or more than anybody in the Brotherhood today, except, well, they're still alive. I know and I understand that people are not ready or not willing yet in a lot of cases to understand that. It takes a little bit of change in your mind. But the bride of Christ is the church. And that's what he said he was going to show him. And I will promise you that if you follow this throughout the next few weeks, maybe months, that you will see how important this is. So, what is what the angel showed John? The church, the bride of Christ. Now, what did Jesus build? He built the church, right? Was it physical or spiritual? Spiritual. How would you describe something that is spiritual? Use an earthly example. Use a physical example that we know and understand. 
Okay? A physical example that we know and understand. Why is it called the body of Christ? Because that is a physical example of something that is spiritual in nature, right? A physical example of something that is spiritual in nature. So what we have in Revelation 21 and 22 is a physical description of a spiritual church. A physical description of a spiritual church. Are there questions? Do you understand where I'm at and what I'm saying? Anybody want yet? Anybody ready yet to <laughs> jump out there and say it can't be? That's why I called it the New Jerusalem. And that is, this is, will give you an idea of some of the things that we're going to do in the Old Testament. What was Old Jerusalem? Okay, Mount Zion. Mount... Uh, Okay, Mount, uh, it was the old Jerusalem was the, the old city, the old city of God, or the old city where the Jews worshipped. Where did they worship? In the temple in Jerusalem. Now we worship in, and, I, and, and I, we're not going to do this a lot, but I'm going to take you through it a little bit to let you understand. We worship in New Jerusalem. Why New Jerusalem? Because the old physical Jerusalem is gone. We worship in spiritual Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem. So they worshiped where? Old Jerusalem, we worship where? New Jerusalem. We worship in the New Jerusalem. Revelation says there's no need of a temple in the New Jerusalem. There was a temple in the Old Jerusalem, right? Why do we not have, have a temple in New Jerusalem? It is the temple, right? We are the temple of God. So you don't have another temple within the temple. All right, the church is spiritual. It's the body of Christ. It's the household of God. We could list 20 of them. All right. One way the church is described in the Bible is it's the bride of Christ. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. A physical description of a spiritual city. And I want to, I've got 10 minutes and I wanted to get into this with you a little bit tonight. And uh, next week we'll continue right on down. We're going to, in the next week or so, a couple of weeks here, we are going to build the church that Jesus built from the Bible. I'm going to give you a mental picture of a spiritual kingdom from Revelation 21 and 22. First of all, if you're going to build anything, where do you start? All right. You want to start with a foundation. All right. In Revelation 21, 14, it says the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles. Now, I want you to turn your thinking away. And, you know, we've used this. And by the way, I'm going to tell you this. You know, I, I talk to a lot of people about this. I have talked to a lot of people over the years about this. And um, I have a lot of people tell me that they always thought this represented the church. They just didn't figure out, didn't know how. So you're not by yourself. I, but I do want you to, I want you to 
be there and understand this if I can possibly help you. The wall of a city, 12 foundations, the names of the 12 apostles. Now then, what, what is that telling us about the church? What's the foundation of the church? We've read this verse so many times, but we don't make the connection. It says, Now therefore you are no more no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. What's the household of God? We don't have any trouble with that, do we? The household of God's the church and are built up on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. What is the foundation of the church? The teachings of whom? Jesus and the apostles. And what did the prophets teach? The coming of Christ and the grace that would appear to us. So what is the spiritual foundation of the church? The teachings of the twelve apostles, the prophets, with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Now, why does it say then in Revelation 21 14 that the names of the 12 apostles were written in the foundation of the church? Absolutely. That's exactly what it is. The apostles. Teachings is what formed the church. The Holy Spirit came down on the apostles on the day of Pentecost and they began to teach. The things that they taught were the foundation of the church. Now, if you're going to explain to somebody what the foundation of the church is, how do you explain it? You can't see a spiritual foundation, can you? So what do you have to picture it as what? A literal foundation with the names written in it that tell us what it is. The teachings of the twelve apostles. That's the church. It's the spiritual church. And we've got time. I want to start on this. I don't know that we'll get to it, but anyway. I want to move, let's, let's build, we'll get the foundation and the wall built tonight, hopefully. The wall of the church, and the building of the wall of it was jasper. Well, jasper is thought to be a red, a red stone. Some say it's diamond. It's okay, but I prefer the red, and it will become very evident to you why as I go through it. The wall of the church, it was 12,000 furlongs in every direction and 144 cubits thick. Now, what was the, and you have to understand that what we have pictured here is something that these people would be extremely familiar with at that particular time. Did they have walls around their cities? All of them did, nearly. Why? Protection. Protection. The wall around the city was for protection. Now, who could you let in? People who lived there, or you could... Keep people that you didn't want in, you could keep them out, right? That was the whole idea of the wall of a, around a city. 
was for protection. If you lived inside the wall, you were a citizen of that particular city, right? Now, is there a wall to the church? This wall pictured in Revelation 21 is 12,000 furlongs in every direction. Now, how big a wall did the people in the Old Testament times want around their city? The bigger the better, right? Big as the, bigger the better, big as they could get. Now, do you have any idea what 12,000 furlongs is? It's 1,500 miles. Okay? This church, is fit, this drawing or this representation in 21 and 22 is 1,500 miles in every direction. 1,500 miles length, width, and height. Now, what, would have, what would they have thought about a wall that was 1,500 miles tall? Was there any way to get inside of it? I don't believe you could even fathom getting in that wall, right? That was an impenetrable wall. It, yeah, absolutely, way out there. Now, so they had a wall. It was a wall. A, there's, this is a description of a wall around the church. Now, that was prophesied in Isaiah. And this tells you what the wall around the church is. In that day, and I'll tell you this just right quickly, anytime you see those three words, I, well, I will harp on those three words forever around here. In that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. That is a prophecy of the coming of the church. He says, we have a strong city. How strong is that city pictured here? Well, it's so strong it can't be destroyed. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. What's the, what is the spiritual wall of our city? Salvation, isn't it? Salvation. Who's inside that city? Those who are saved, those who have come inside that city are saved. Those who are outside that city are not. Can those outside break in? No, because that wall is so high and so thick, isn't it? Yet are we allowed to go out? You know, God's not going to, He's not going to keep us in. You know, it's up to us to stay in. But how strong is the salvation of God? John said that he pictured Jesus, uh, God holding the, the angels. Or the, I'm trying to go back to the book of John. He said he holds us in his hand. Now how strong is God's hand? Unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, can anybody, that's, that's the way the verse goes. No man can take him out. Of my hand. Can anybody come and drag you out of the church? Not a chance because of the strength of the wall of salvation. Okay. It's 8 o'clock. This is where we're going. We'll continue this next week. You can uh, go home and read it. I wish you'd read those two chapters several times and uh, then you can bring questions and we will forge forge on through. If you would, let's have a prayer. Father, we're thankful for the day you've just blessed us with and we're thankful for the opportunity to study. We pray, Father, that we may learn and glean the truths from your word that you would have us to know. Bless us through the following week. Keep us safe and bring us back on Sunday. We pray in Jesus' name.